at the moment, they're still holding to their deadline of, that they set a while back of getting this bill done by Memorial Day, which is to say out of the full uh, Energy and Commerce Committee in the House by Memorial Day. That's an unbelievably tight deadline for something this big. The bill is 648 pages long, and it doesn't have the most important component in it yet, which is the allocation process. Nobody ever lost money betting long term on Congress missing its deadlines. I think they may resolve this by Memorial Day, but I think uh, things fail on time and they pass late uh, is one of the general rules. You can always get a bill to fail pretty quickly if you want to. But assuming for the moment that it passes, and it passes something close to you know, their self-imposed deadline of Memorial Day, at some point, as I said, the, the Senate will take it up. They will probably take it up as soon as, the, as, soon as it's out of committee. Uh, and not wait for it to go to the full floor vote to start making their own version of this bill. So the key question then is what about the Senate? Does the Senate have 60 votes to pass this bill? At the moment, the way politics are, uh, pretty much every vote in the Senate is requiring uh, 60. Normally a vote only takes 50, but because you've ever seen Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you know that you can filibuster if you're a senator and require 60 votes to, uh, to move things forward procedurally. At the moment, the Democrats certainly do not uh, have 60 votes to pass this bill in the Senate. They probably have three Republican votes that they can count on and 15 Democratic votes that they really, really have to worry about. And there's only, at the moment, uh, 58 uh, Democrats, uh, though there may be 60 soon. We're waiting uh, for the Al Franken-Coleman race to resolve itself in Minnesota, and I just heard about an hour ago that Arlen Specter is switching parties, which is, uh, was, is fairly remarkable. Um, though he is also, you know, despite changing his, his, uh, his designation, he's still sort of on the fence uh, about this whole, this whole approach to climate change. This is a recipe for stalemate, I'm afraid, this year. However, Plan B. The EPA announced last week an official finding of endangerment that carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, GHGs, uh, are a threat to the health and welfare of current and future generations. This is how it designates pollution. This would give the EPA authority to regulate carbon emissions, to reduce carbon emissions. The EPA, under the Clean Air Act, created the first that I'm aware of in the United States cap and trade system to cover acid rain in the Northeast. It's conceivable that they could put together their own cap and trade policy on carbon to cover the entire country. That seems unlikely, but it's a, that's a highly legal and technical uh, point that I cannot, uh, that I'm not the best judge of. And at the moment, what I'm hearing from my lawyer friends is that they could conceivably do a cap and trade system, but it would probably be uh, a mix of command and control, uh, automobile regulations, smokestack regulations and a cap-and-trade overlaid on top of it, potentially unbelievably expensive. But this is the 800-pound gorilla. Last year when we were debating Lieberman Warner, the, the, the Bush administration, while well, A, wasn't terribly inclined to do anything about climate change, but did not have this tool, uh, this threat, this looming threat of the EPA taking over, you know, basically taking over Congress's job for it and legislating through the EPA carbon regulations. The Obama administration says they want to do something about climate change. Lisa Jackson, EPA administrator, says she wants to do something about climate change. And they're very, very uh, quietly wielding this big stick. At a, uh, there were a series of hearings last week. Uh, Lisa Jackson, the EPA administrator, was testifying at one, and she said very clearly all the things that you'd want to hear, uh, I think, if you were a legislator, which is you know, with a smile on her face, that she's say, claiming that she does not want to regulate carbon that she would rather see things done through the Congress, through regular order, but that they're retaining their options. This is a very thinly veiled message to the Congress that if they don't do something, the EPA might. Uh, it's a very new, new dynamic on the Hill. A lot of people still aren't sure exactly what to make of it. Another element to keep in mind here is uh, the international climate negotiations that are going to take place in Copenhagen this coming December. Frankly, the world is a little bit tired of waiting for the United States to show up and make good faith efforts at negotiating this. We really haven't done anything like that 
uh, certainly in the end of the Bush administration. The rest of the world appears, at least I should say, claims that they are ready to move forward on restricting their own carbon emissions, although no one really wants to act unless the United States takes part, because we are responsible for roughly a quarter of global carbon emissions. So it doesn't make a lot of sense from their point of view to go ahead and regulate themselves if the largest source is not going to regulate itself. Obama and others, well, everybody believes that, that looks at this, is, is concerned that if the United States does not show up with something serious to this Copenhagen negotiation, that the whole process may fall apart, will grind to a halt, much like the Doha round uh, of the WTO has ground to an ignominious death. Um, Obama has said that he doesn't want to kill this process. If he's not going to kill the process, he has to show up with something. What will it be? Is it enough? And this is an open question that nobody really knows the answer to. Is it enough to show up with a bill that's passed the relevant committee in the House, plus this endangerment finder finding from the EPA to convince people that the United States is serious or ready to get serious? I'm not sure. I'll give you my speculation. I believe that Waxman can get this bill out of his committee. If it was anyone but Waxman, by the way, I would bet my house against it. But Waxman is one of the best bill wranglers in the House at the moment. I also think he's got to get something out of this committee. I won't go into the details, but there's a huge fight over who got to be in charge of this committee. And he ousted John Dingell, a 50-year veteran from Michigan, because Dingell couldn't move climate legislation. For that reason alone, I think he sees that he has to save face. He has to get something out of this committee. I think it will get done. Whether it will get done by Memorial Day is anybody's guess. The only way, it might be that the only way he gets it out of this committee is to promise the members that they won't have to vote for it on the full floor of the House. That's, uh, that's not a common strategy, but it's certainly not unheard of. So how serious is the United States? Well, uh, polling, despite what many people would like to believe, polling tells us that climate change just does not enter into the public conscious the way we want it to. If you're serious about climate change, you really want the public to be paying attention. As late as, these are slightly dated, but this is you know, not too far before the election here, October of 2008, the public was still concerned a lot more about the economy, maybe rightly so, than it was about climate change or, frankly, any other environmental uh, uh, concern, or, frankly, any other concern, full stop, it was the economy. Going back a little bit further before things really started to fall apart, even then, you can see down towards the bottom, energy policy, gas prices uh, really didn't break into the public consciousness. I don't think that's going to last. Uh, I think it, once people see some of the impacts that folks are projecting for climate change, I think this is going to enter people's consciousness. I think the Obama administration has made it abundantly clear that it intends to do something about climate change. And I think, frankly, that with a little bit of effort of getting the public behind this, that at some point in his administration, he'll feel confident enough that he's got the public support behind him to actually go ahead and try something big and bold to get climate, done, uh, climate policy done. To my mind, it's only a matter of time. It's up to us, those of us in, you know, who like to think we know something about how to write sensible climate policy, and people in the business world who I think actually do know something, about how to use energy and maybe how to use it a little bit more efficiently than we do now to make sure that it costs us as little as possible. But one way or the other, we are going to be living in a carbon-constrained constrained economy in the not-too-distant future. And uh, sorry, here's the time scroll from, from June before the economy fell apart, and you see that the, the global warming is way down near the bottom. As I said, I expect that to change. With that, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Chris is going to talk a little bit about uh, carbon accounting, enterprise accounting, uh, and climate earth.